Hello everybody and welcome to LAB from the very beautiful Champagne Bar at Marco Pierre White this week and I'm privileged to be joined by Judge Jim Tyndall. Those of you who've been following my socials this week will know that I've been bigging this up all week and thanks a lot to those of you who sent in questions for Jim. So Jim and I have met perhaps three or four years ago, yeah. so when I was a trainee and you were a barrister, That's so right. yeah. we were both in very different places in our legal career then. Jim has had a very colourful pathway through law, which we're going to get into in just a minute. But first of all, Jim, I just wanted you to tell us a little bit about what you do now and what your role consists of. Okay, um, I'm a circuit judge, and so um, the easiest way of explaining that is that most of my work involves uh, criminal cases with a jury. So a Crown Court judge with a wig in full gown and all the rest of it with a jury. But um, some of my work, what I'm doing at the moment, involves civil cases. So that can be large personal injury cases, contract, uh, contract disputes, um, property disputes, things like that. Okay, so all very interesting. And tell us about your very interesting pathway into law, because you haven't always been a judge. So how no. did this start off? Did you do a law degree at university? I did. I did a law degree at Birmingham. Um, and then I did uh, the legal practice course to become a solicitor. And I was a solicitor in Wolverhampton for... Um, well, including my training contract, I was about two years post-qualification, um, having been a solicitor, and I was uh, effectively a full-time advocate. And so I decided to become a barrister, and uh, I joined St Philip's Chambers and was a barrister for about ten years there before going becoming a full-time judge. But in the last four or five years of being a barrister, I was also a part-time judge in various roles. Okay, so that is a really interesting choice of career. I know a few of you have asked about how you choose between becoming a solicitor and a barrister and what happens if you change your mind halfway through. So it's not unusual for people to change from being a solicitor to a barrister, but it's not that common either. So I just wondered a little bit what, what your decision-making process was around changing from a solicitor to a barrister and what it was that made you change your mind. Well, the thing about being a solicitor, as I found, is that you're running a number of different cases. You've got an, um, you're having to deal with everything that relates to all of those cases, and it's quite challenging. It, the, the particular skills you need um, are very different from the skills that you need as an advocate. Uh, I found, bluntly, I was much better at being an advocate than I was at being a solicitor, and so it made sense for my firm to encourage me to move in the direction more of advocacy, and from there, by the end, I wasn't really doing any um, of my own files. I was almost entirely doing other people's files, but doing the advocacy on them. So it was a fairly short step for me to move to being a barrister, which is essentially doing the same thing. And practically, was that straightforward, or is it difficult to actually do that on a practical level? Do you have to take another set of exams? Do you have to do anything differently to how you would do normally? Once you're qualified as a solicitor, it's very straightforward. So I, I first made the inquiry when I was still a trainee solicitor, and I was told that I'd have to um, take the bar vocational course, um, uh, do various other exams and all the rest of it. But... Once I qualified as a solicitor and once I could demonstrate that I was doing a lot of advocacy, um, the only exam I had to do was a professional conduct exam, which was quite straightforward. Okay, and are there any particular skills that you needed over and above a normal solicitor in order to change to being a barrister, or could you change at any point in your career with the relevant level experience? Well, I mean, no one ever believes this, but it's true. I think, for me, I was not... I didn't think I was... I had the skills that I needed to become a really good solicitor. And so I think rather than having additional skills, the skills that I had were better suited to becoming an advocate. Um, and so for me, I think it, it, it was recognising that I my strengths lay in that particular direction, recognising that that was a logical career move for me. And also, I was given a lot of encouragement by my firm and the other things, of course, is that they, the, the, the Bar Council would want you to have your own, uh, to have a pupillage lined up. So they don't want to put more people onto the marketplace as, um, as qualified, in inverted commas, to become barristers if they haven't got a pupillage lined up. So that was, that was the most difficult bit, actually. And, and that was just like applying for a training contract all over again. It's just like I was doing it four years later. And when you became a barrister, did you practice in the same areas that you were practicing in as a solicitor 
or did you branch out a little bit and do different areas as an advocate? To start with, um, I mainly did the areas I was doing as a solicitor. So I was doing a lot when I was a, a, a junior barrister, a very junior barrister. I was doing um, a lot of personal injury work, um, employment work in particular, which I did a lot of when I was a uh, solicitor, and a bit of crime as well, because certainly at my chamber, St Phillips, you did a, a multidisciplinary tenancy. So when you first started, you did all sorts of things. Um, but after about a couple of years, you tended to specialise in particular areas, and my areas were primarily personal injury and employment. Okay, and um, sort of taking that to your next career move, when you then became a judge, what was the practical process that is involved in changing from becoming a barrister into a judge? Well, I think, and I think I'd like to pick up one of the questions that someone asked, which was um, where, whether you have to be a barrister first before you become yeah. a judge. And yeah. the answer is absolutely not. Um, the, the best um, source of any of this information is the Judicial Appointments Commission website, and they have a lot of guidance on this. And effectively, what you have to demonstrate is that you have the requisite legal experience. Now, that can be legal experience as a solicitor. It can be legal experience as a barrister. It can be legal experience as an academic, although that's a less well-trodden path. I Actually, I'd say that the vast majority of judges have not been barristers because the vast majority of judges who are, for example, tribunal judges or district judges, uh, most of them have come from the solicitor's profession. I I'd say probably still that most circuit judges have come uh, from the bar, the barrister's profession, but that's um, less and less common, in fact. I think it's increasingly common for district judges to make the move to becoming a circuit judge. And so I think you certainly, if you want to become a judge, you certainly don't have to become a barrister first. Okay, no, that's, that's really helpful to know. I didn't even know that, so <laughs> it's all a learning curve. Um, and in terms of, I know we talked about you did practice in similar areas as a barrister than you did as solicitor, but you're practicing or you're judging quite different law now to the yeah. that you were practicing. Has that been difficult? Have you had to learn completely new areas of law yeah. in an and academic I, way? In, in fairness, actually, you're being very polite, but I didn't answer your question. I answered it with a different one, which is a very politician thing to do. But <laughs> I think you, uh, what I ended up doing as a judge was to do a variety of different judicial roles. And I started as a judge where I'd started as an advocate, because that seemed to me to make sense. So I uh, applied for a position as an employment judge, um, and I applied more or less at the same time as a position um, as a deputy district judge in the magistrate's court. And I got both of those at roughly the same time. And so I've ever since I became a judge, there's always been a mixture of work that I've been doing. On one hand, criminal type work. On the other hand, I suppose civil or employment type work and that mix has been there all the way through so whilst at the beginning it did feel quite challenging for example to go back into crime which I hadn't done for three or four years not half as challenging as it would have been if I hadn't done that and I'd become a circuit judge and then got appointed into crime not having done it for 10 years that would have been a very that would have been a huge learning curve I just thought that frankly becoming a judge is enough of a learning curve to be going along with and um, to take it in baby steps, really. Yeah, okay. And if you don't mind me saying, you are quite a young judge. Lots of people think of judges as being old and grey and having had a whole career behind them. And obviously you did take quite a lot of steps in your career. But is there a certain age that you have to be to be a judge? And we've talked a little bit about the qualification route, but it, it's, it's quite unusual to, to be such a young judge. And is, is that because of you wanted to change quite early in your career or is it more common than people think? Well I mean the first thing to say is that actually I probably I'm now 42 and I'm not sure that is that long young for being a judge anymore. I mean for example I've got a colleague from Chambers who's just been appointed as a full-time district judge and she I think is 35, 36. Um, when I was first appointed as a part-time I was 33 and so I suppose you could say that I was appointed as a full-time at 40. So the seven-year period was quite quick. But that was because, um, nothing to do with my innate merits or lack of them, it was more to do with the fact that I prioritised it. So rather than, tr I, I was obviously practising as a barrister, I wanted to build an interesting practice as a barrister, but I was also making sure that I did as much 
judicial work as I could, sitting as it's called. Um, and I think that's not always the case. I think people become a part-time judge sometimes because it looks good on the CV, um, but they don't have any particular ambitions to become full-time, which is fair enough. Um, but I did, and so I made sure that I did as much sitting as I could, and that's probably the reason why I did it reasonably quickly. Okay. And um if you're giving advice to a junior lawyer or someone who is studying law who has aspirations of being a judge, are there any particular pieces of advice that you would give them in terms of things that they can do now or things they can look out for or participate in that would make that transition easier later in life? Well, I've referred already to the Judicial Appointments Commission website. Yeah. And the important thing about that website is that all judicial positions are appointed by that commission according to set criteria which are set, more or less set in stone. And so actually the most practical and helpful thing I could probably say at this stage is, if you're interested, look at it, because it gives you lots of guidance and information in relation to how practically you go about doing it. And what it also gives you is the criteria against which you'd be measured if you applied. And what I found really helpful is the idea that if I had the criteria, I could keep a diary of my different experiences. So for example, one of the criteria is uh, that they always ask you about in an interview is give an example of a situation when you've had to handle a challenging situation. Mm. And, and one of my first days as a judge in the magistrate school, I had um, a defendant who I knew had mental health problems who came into the court and gave me a hypnosis salute and was, uh, I had to basically win him over. And so I knew in the back of my head, however difficult that morning was, I could write it down and thought, okay, that's a that's a good example of something I can use. And I think it's not it's never too soon to start keeping those examples. So if people are just starting a training contract and they've got they've handled a really difficult situation uh, really well, make a note of it because that can be something that in the future that you might be able to use. And as long as you keep examples and evidence, uh, and you're not just asserting skills and you can actually evidence them with examples, I think that's that's the best way to to progress in, in an application. Okay, so I have a, I have got one question that's been sent in by Andrew, aged eight and a half, from Bearwood, okay. who we uh, may or may not both know. <laughs> Is it true that if you were Lord Chancellor, you would let judges dress casual, not wear a tie, get all stubbly, and dispense justice over a mocha in a hipster cafe in Moseley? Yeah, it's more or less what I do now. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I mean, for example, when I have a jury, I have to dress up. Um, but when you have cases involving child witnesses, um, it's a good excuse to take the wigs off. And I always like doing that because it, it feels a bit stupid to wear a wig and to dress up. Um, but when I do civil work, any excuse to not have to wear a wig and a gown, I will mm. take it. Um, if I could do it, particularly in the summer, in shorts and a T-shirt, I would. But I think probably I'd get told off if I did that. No, that sounds that sounds like a great idea. I'd wholly support that. I, if you I mean, didn't become Lord Chancellor. I have, I have suggested on other occasions, like when you're at school, you know, when you have a really cool teacher, you can go and do a lesson under the tree outside. Yeah. I'd love to be able to do that, but it's not really compatible, I think, with no. modern corporate. Well, protocol. I don't know, it's changing. Legal <laughs> profession is changing. It's innovative, who knows, well, we'll be practicing law exactly. in 10 years' time. Um, one last question before I let you go. I just wanted to know, for the benefit of you guys as well, what your three top tips would be for an aspiring lawyer entering the profession in the current climate. This is probably going to sound quite like a statement of the obvious, but I think it, it, it is something which um, I think it's something I thought about, and it's something which I, I think is right. The first is qualifications. Um, that doesn't mean you have to go to the best university in the world. It doesn't mean that you're forever cursed if you haven't done as well as you would have liked to have done at your A-levels. It does mean that if once you're at university, you have to do the best you can and to get the best qualifications you can because that will stand you in good stead. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is experience. So do as much experience as you can. So while you're still a student, try and do try and work at a CAB or a law centre or... Um, I know a lot of colleges, College of Law and university, legal universities offer um, free advice helplines to the public and stuff. Do that because anything you can do to demonstrate the fact that you, uh, you, you can hit the ground running as someone who isn't just learning law in an academic context but has actually applied it by speaking to people, the better. And the third, I think, is perseverance because it's not easy. 
I mean, people, it's not a conveyor belt. You can't just go straight from school to university into a job. It's difficult. I mean, I've been really, really lucky and really privileged. My journey hasn't been as difficult as it is from other people, but it still had its moments where it's been, you know, you know. I, I, at once, I do remember vividly the year before, before I became a judge, I was all for giving up and becoming a shepherd. But actually, <laughs> just at the right time, um, the, uh, the, the right job came along and, you know, the career turned around. And, you know, you, it's sometimes, it really is that just before, it's, it seems the worst and, and, and just before that happens, then you all, all of a sudden you turn a corner and your career takes off. And, and so stick with it. I couldn't agree with that more. Definitely a lot of messages that I send home in a lot of my videos. So from the horse's mouth, thank you so much, Jim, for coming on LAB today. I hope you guys have found that useful and I will catch you in my video next week. Bye guys.